Hello world, it's Aaron. Today I will be talking about machine learning for everyone. So who am I? Well, I am Aaron Ma. I'm 12 years old and I have a tremendous passion in computer science ever since I was five. I'm a hardcore software and hardware developer and I'm the world's youngest potential contributor. I love robotics, machine learning algorithms, TensorFlow, Python, C++, and much more. I'm also the world's youngest graduated from Udacity Cell Vanguard Engineering Naming Program, and much more. And you can follow me on Twitter, at Aaron H. Ma. So for those of you who've seen me talk before, hello there. For those of you who are new to see me talk, hi there. So today, we'll be going on a journey to the moon. Will we come back? Let's find out. Oh, wait, we're at West Hall. So hold on tight and get ready for a blast off. So now let's start off by talking about machine learning core concept. So first of all, machine learning is not a joke. So if you're laughing, no, very unacceptable. Let's begin. So machine learning is the study of its complex algorithm and statistical model. It has the ability to learn and improve from its own experience without being explicitly programmed without any human intervention or assistance. The goal in machine learning is to find the algorithm along with the weights and biases that come with it when tweaking the input hyperparameters that we as humans give it. So machine learning is not magic or a black box. It's rather using tools and technologies to answer questions based on data. So here's the machine learning pipeline. On the left hand side, we gather our data and apply pre-processing techniques to the data to make sure it's in a stable format for machine learning. Then on the right hand side, we apply a learning algorithm to the data set and then train our model. If our model has a pretty good accuracy, we might want to deploy it to the real world. If not, we might want to update our model again and retrain it in hope of getting a better accuracy. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense. We'll cover all of this in my talk. So let's take that machine learning in a human friendly way. So let's meet John. John loves new music. He loves music with a fast tempo in the genre of rock, but he dislikes music with a slow tempo in the genre of pop. So let's, we can plot his like music and dislike music on an X, Y axis graph, as you can see here. The X axis is the music genre from pop to rock. The Y axis is the music tempo from relaxy fast. So let's say John was listening to a new song, Master of Puppets by Metallica. Where do you think the point will go at? If you guess so somewhere around here, you're correct. How about Bad Guy by Billy Eilish? Where do you think the point will be at? So now, some of you might be saying, John probably liked the song. And some of you might be saying, John probably disliked the song. Well, here, we can use a machine learning algorithm known as k nearest neighbors. So what we do here is we need to set a k parameter. So if k was four, then we draw a circle with four data points inside. Now we can go with the majority and say that John would probably like the song. So let's take a look at a few more scenarios of machine learning in the real world. For example, Twitter. I'm pretty sure most of us here uses Twitter. So have you ever wondered how Twitter gives you recommended tweets? So whenever you follow someone, there's always an algorithm watching you to bring the content for you. But how? Well, whenever you follow someone, the, the algorithm automatically gets tweets from that user and then calculates a probability if you will like this tweet or not. And then it'll show the tweets from the best to the worst in your explore card. How about Uber? Well, Uber uses machine learning in a wide variety of their products. For example, in the Rideshare app, they can predict the number of sales they're going to have in a day and also supply and demand. Also, for their support, they have automated chatbots to help users quickly get the support they need. Also, there's account personalization, dynamic pricing, and also detecting fraud activity. All of this is based on machine learning. So let's learn machine learning today. So there are three fields of study in machine learning. The first field of study is artificial intelligence or AI. This is the broad discipline of creating intelligent machines to think for their own selves. Machine learning or ML is a subset of AI 
and it's a system that can learn from its own experience without any human intervention. Deep learning, or DL, is a subset of AI and machine learning. And it's a system that can learn from experience on humongous data sets. So when we're talking about machine learning, we're actually referring to three different things. The first thing is called supervised learning. It's task-driven, so it takes the data as the input and the labels as the target. Without training, the model will find some correlation between the input and the target. Supervised learning is best at solving regression and classification problems. Regression is where we need to predict a continuous value. For example, what is the price of the stock Apple going to be on a particular day? Classification, on the other hand, comes in form of yes-no questions. For example, is this picture a cat? Yes or no? There's also unsupervised learning. This is data-driven, so which means there's no labels and the data is not structured. We can only solve clustering problems where we need to group similar things together. Finally, there's reinforcement learning and it's algorithm driven, so it learns from its own experience. So if it does something good, it gets a reward. If it does something bad, the reward is taken away. So supervised learning is what we're gonna focus on in this talk. Unsupervised learning is gonna be beyond the scope right now, and you want to learn about reinforcement learning, don't forget to go to my website at aaronhsma.com and click on view my previous talk, and you can see my talk on reinforcement learning, where you get to build your own cell drain car in the browser. How cool is that? So let's take a look at a sample supervised learning problem. For example, classification. So have you ever wondered how Gmail spam folder works? Well, here's how it works. There's a bunch of emails marked as spam and not spam. Then we feed it in, into a computer and the computer will learn the relationship between emails marked as spam or not spam. So when email comes in, it can automatically categorize if it's spam or not spam. But why should you use machine learning for it? Well, let's take a look at that in a traditional approach. In the traditional way, we will study the problem first then write a bunch of rules. For example, the text contains awesome or for you or free many, many times, and it's probably going to be spam. And if not, it's probably not going to be spam. So we're going to evaluate this approach, and if it's pretty good, then we'll probably just launch it. If it's bad, we won't want to write some more rules. But for example, what if a spammer change the O and awesome to a zero? Sorry, consumer, we forgot to block that spam email. So this is why we should use machine learning. Once we study the problem, then we can train our machine learning algorithm based on the data. And it's pretty good, then we can launch it. And if not, we might want to update our model a little bit. But the reason we use the machine learning approach is that this can be automated. So if a user reports an email as spam, as long as we get new data, we can automatically train our model again to get even better results. How about clustering in unsupervised learning? Take a look at these images on this slide. What if there was a million of these images, and then I asked to store it into three different groups? It can take more than 20 years just to do this. This is where unsupervised learning shines. Using the unsupervised learning algorithm, it automatically identifies which items are similar to each other. In this case, the triangles will go together, the cubes together, and the circles will go together. In total, there will be three groups. How about reinforcement learning? Take a look at this thing. Pretty easy, right? But how can we teach this to a computer? Well, to do this, we better need to better understand what reinforcement learning is. The mouse in this place is the machine learning agent, which will play in our environment, which is the maze. So in the first learning epoch, we, the agent might just keep moving forward and then gets electrocuted because it dies. But after many, many learning epochs, eventually it'll get to the desired output, which is the cheese, and it'll get there quickly and efficiently. How about neural networks? Neural networks are the foundational building blocks for machine learning. It's a computer software that was inspired by the brain and it's made of units like neurons in our brain to solve a problem together. So a neural network is basically a stack of layers. Each layer is made up of units. For example, in our input layer, we have three units. You may also notice that each of these layers are fully connected. So we can call this a dense layer. You may also notice in the hidden layer and the output layer, we have Ws and Bs. These are called the weights and biases, which are the internal variables of our models, which are going to be updated throughout training. And by model, we're basically representing 
a neural network. So here, literally, is the world's simplest neural network. All we do is just take in an X and Y. If you remember from your Algebra 1 classes that functions, we just multiply X by Y to get the output. So if X was 3 and Y was 7, the output would be 21. So here it is in Python. Basically, this is the exact same thing, except for we're just, in, we're just multiplying 8.5 by 0 0.1, and we have 0 0.85. But that's just silly. In today's monorail, there's going to be lots and lots of hidden layers. That's why let's take a look at a deep dive and deep neural networks. But hey, congratulations on trying the most brutal part on the rocket. So let's say we're going to build a neural network to classify a square, a triangle, and a star. So we'll feed these images into our input layer. Then our, we'll pass in those images from our input layer to our hidden layers, which will perform the required computation for our model. Finally, the output layer will hold our output. There will be three neurons in our output layer. The number of neurons in the classification problem like this one depends on the number of types that you're feeding into your model. In this case, three, a square, a triangle, and a star. So let's say we're going to feed it an image of a triangle to a neural network. So this image is 28 by 28 pixels, or in total, 784 pixels. So there will be 784 neurons in our input layer, one for each pixel. Then we'll pass those into our hidden layers through lines called channels. Each of these channels has its own number known as the weight, and each neuron in the hidden layer has its own number, the bias. Thus, we can formulate the equation y equals wx plus b, where x is the data in the input neuron, w is the weight, and b is the bias. Once we have that number, we need to go through an activation function. In this case, we we'll want to go through a sigma function. So it gives us a value from zero to one, so we can use it for predicting probability as the output. And also it's called sigmoid because if we plot it out on chart, we get the shape of an S, thus sigmoid. So this step is calculated every step of our hidden layer. So now if we go to our N, our output layer, we can see we have a wrong prediction. But this is only half of the story. This is called forward propagation. Right after four propagation, we see how much we need to improve. So here we can see our machine's prediction and also our errors and also the target. And the one here beside the triangle tells us that is the desired output. Now for the other half of the story, back propagation. Now we know how to improve our model. We go through back propagation where we adjust the weights and biases in hope of reducing the error. So at the many epochs of forward propagation, back propagation, forward propagation, and so much more, we eventually have a correct prediction. And you can see that after many iterations of training, we have reduced error and increased accuracy. So now you might be thinking, how long does this training take? Well, it can take anywhere from minutes to hours to even a continuous amount of days. So let's take a look at the machine learning process. So here it is. So blah, 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 blah. Let's take a look at that in an easier way. The first step is to gather our data. So machine learning depends largely on our training data. So we need a large amount of data and high quality data. So where can we find a large amount of data and high quality data? Well, we can find it from one of these sources. For example, Google's data sets, Kaggle, UCI machine learning repo, the Hacker Earth, Amazon, Microsoft, etc. The next step is to pre-process our data. This basically involves selecting our data, filtering it, transforming it, and also visualizing the data to get a better sense of it. Basically, just cleaning our data to make it similar for machine learning. Next, we choose an algorithm. This algorithm will be used to train our model. So make sure you choose wisely. Because if you choose a model, uh, an algorithm that is not similar for your data, then you'll have very bad accuracy. So choose an algorithm that's suited for your data to have a high accuracy. So you can get some algorithm from popular likes like Scikit-Learn and Keras. So most commonly used machine learning algorithms include linear regression, logistic regression, decision tree, k-means, etc. The next step is to build and compile our model. Here, we'll build our model layer by layer, and each layer will have its own weights that correspond to the layer. And also don't forget to add an activation function. So here, 
we will build our model by first defining a sequential layer, which basically defines a linear stack of network layers. And here we can add layers to our model using the model.add API. And also here we, where you can see that we're adding a dense layer, which is basically a fully connected neural network that's the ReLU activation function. So then we need to compile our model using the optimizer, like how we're going to improve our model, the loss, calculating the error of our model, and the metrics, and also the weights. The next step is to train our model. So we make a prediction based on the current state of the model, and then we calculate how bad the prediction is. And then we go through back propagation, so we update the weights and biases to minimize this error and, and, and make this model better. So we train our model using the model.fit API with the training data and also the training label. Then we, we also add the number of epochs and also the batch size and the callback. Make sure that when choosing your epochs, you're choosing a good amount. For example, if you're choosing such a very high number of epochs, you'll go through something called overfitting, which basically means your model has already memorized the training data and it does horribly on the testing data set. And underfitting is where your model didn't learn anything during training and also it performed badly during testing. And also the back size says the number of samples that will iterate through our data set in an, in an epoch. And also a callback is, for example, if we reach a specific accuracy or loss, you might want to stop training in order to not overfit. So the next step is to test the model. We see how well our model has the data set throughout training. And we predict our prediction using model.predict along with the testing X data. And then we repeat this process. So if machine learning is this easy, who uses it? Well, there's researchers, data scientists, machine learning engineers, and wizards, sorry, developers, and me. So congratulations on making it this far. Now we're at the second stage separation. Okay, let's talk about traditional learning versus machine learning. So make sure you pay attention to this part because this is a very commonly asked interview question. In fact, if you go to a machine learning interview, this might be the first question an interview asks you. What is the difference between traditional learning and machine learning? Well, let's take a look at that. So let's play a game. Well, not really a game because video controllers aren't allowed. So if you don't have one, good job. So in traditional software development, we already know the input and the algorithm and we just write a function that gets the output. In machine learning, on the other hand, we take in pairs and pairs and pairs and put in output data and we create a model that will figure out the algorithm. In machine learning, we're more focusing on how our data has been represented, while in traditional self-development, we're more focusing on our code. So let's say we're solving the Celsius to Fahrenheit problem using traditional self-development. Well, here we take your input, which is Celsius, and can use the algorithm, which is Celsius times 1.8 plus 32 to get the output. But in machine learning, we can take in a pair of infinite output data and we create a model and through iterations, we'll figure out the algorithm. So let's take a look at that in a simple scenario. For example, different languages say hello. Hello, hola, bonjour. There are so many languages to say hello. So in traditional self-development, based on the text, let's say what language it is. So the text is hello, then the language is English. And the text is French, in, in hello in French is bonjour. So the text is not hello, the language is French. How about Spanish? In Spanish, hello is hola. So the text is not hello or bonjour. Then it's going to be Spanish. But what language is this in? Hello, what language? It's Chinese. Shh. Oh no, our model has no idea what that means. So the problem was, was that in traditional style development, we have to explicitly set every single possible thing that might happen. So by the time you're done with that, you'd be like this. But then you ask, oh no, there's so many other phrases that you have to write in traditional style development. For example, buy and what are you going to do and so many other stuff like that. <sighs> now what? Well, let's use the magic wand of machine learning. To start, we'll gather our data set, train our model where we'll learn the relationship between the data and the answers to figure out the rule. So let's try it again. What language is this in? Hello, in what language? And as expected, the language is Chinese. Much better. So if you're lazy like me, you can use something called BERT or bidirectional encoder representation from Transformers. This is a state-of-the-art natural language processing model that was developed by Google AI. It's a mechanism that allows you to learn the relationship between words in a text. 
And now we're at the third phase ignition. So we're almost at the moon. So let's talk about the history of machine learning. So now, as you probably know, we have these fancy water-cooled neural networks and, and, also, and also scary water-cooled TPUs. But let's just hold on and then rewind to the year of 1940. In 1940, the idea of machine learning was introduced by the Allied power during World War II. The Allied power thought, if we can have this machine learning thing, we'll definitely win World War II and beat the Axis power. But sadly, there wasn't enough computational power for this to happen. But then, surprisingly, 11 years later, the first neural network by Marvin Minsky from the MIT created a box that, that was made using a neural network. Then, just one year later, the first reinforcement learning agent by Arthur Samuel was made. Then, people were like, this machine learning is so good, it can definitely match an ability of humans. So people started funding to machine learning. But when that happened in 1974, the first machine learning so-called winter started. But then out of the blue, 12 years later in 1996, I mean deep blue defeated the world's chess champion, Gary Kasparov. Just four years later, back propagation for neural networks was introduced, which allows neural networks to train faster and more accurately. But then in 2014, Deep Mind was formed. Just two years later, Deep Mind's AlphaGo beat the world's best co players. And in 2030, AI robots will be taking over our jobs and daily tasks. Uh oh! Did you hear that? If you hear that correctly, you're not going to have a job in 2030. So, how do you still have a job in 2030? By learning TensorFlow! 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 The only one I've got to learn to still have a job in 2030. Okay, so what is this TensorFlow thing? Well, TensorFlow was originally titled Disbelief that the Google Brain team started in 2011. But then they needed some more help, so they decided to open source it and rename the product to TensorFlow in 2015. Then in 2017, TensorFlow 1 was announced, and it also became the world's most hottest machine learning library, and it also included Keras, which allowed people to develop their models quickly and easier to use. Then, Intensive 2 was released last year in, in September. So what's new in Intensive 2? Well, either execution is available by default, and instead of importing Keras, you can use tf.keras. Also, tf.data is a simplified API that allows you to read your training data based on input pipeline. Also, the tf function decorator automatically translates Python programs into potential graphs for you, so you no longer have to use Tensorflow session and can still run Tensorflow one code after two point release, but if you're a professional, don't do it. So the architecture of Tensorflow two actually is pretty easy. We start by reading and pre-processing your data. Then once we have that, we use Keras or a pre-made estimator to build and compile our model. Then we can train our model using the distribution strategy. We'll take full advantage of our CPU, GPU, and CPU. Once it's done training, we can use safe model, which will allow us to deploy our model to cloud, on a phone, on a, on a browser, and also other TensorFlow language bindings. So consider this your first whole application in TensorFlow. So here, we can import TensorFlow as TF. Then we can print out the TensorFlow version. And here you can see I'm on the latest TensorFlow version, 2.2. Now you're, there's so many machine learning Python libraries out there. So why should I use TensorFlow? Well, more importantly, which machine learning library should you use? Well, I got to cover, friend. The top three most popular machine learning libraries as of today are TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Scikit-Learn. TensorFlow by far has the most popular GitHub stars and it's backed by Google. And under the hood, it's based on Keras. PyTorch, on the other hand, has 40K stars and it's backed by Facebook and it's built on top of Cafe2. Finally, Scikit-Learn, or it has 41K GitHub stars and it's backed by the open source community. Let's take a look at statistics, as statistics never lie. But clearly in the past 12 months worldwide, TensorFlow is the world's most popular tensor search term in the machine learning category. So the winner of the machine learning Python library is, drum roll please, TensorFlow. Yes, everyone loves TensorFlow. So now we're at the third stage burnout. Now let's talk about some other tools for machine learning. 
The first one is Jupyter Notebook, which allows you to quickly write Python, Markdown, and other language bindings from the comfort of your own browser. There's also Google Colab, which is basically Google's copy of Jupyter. So here you can see a simple Google Colab here, but ha ha ha, hidden in the rest of the Colab. But what I think is good about Colab is their free stuff. Oh yes, it's completely free. They have free GPUs and TPUs for use. How about NumPy? NumPy, or Numerical Python, is an open source library that you can use for scientific and numerical computing. It was built using Python and C, and it allows efficient computation on arrays. There's also Panda. So here you can see Pandas, Pandas is a high performance data manipulation and analysis tool. And it basically just allows you to clean your, load your data and then clean it and also plot your data. So here you can see in under three lines, you can import a data set from the internet. How cool is that? Let's take a look at that in a human friendly way. So, here we're importing pandas as pd. Okay, we imported pandas. Now, let's read in our pandas.csv file. Okay, we have our csv file. Now, let's clean our data using df.drop. Okay, we're left with shreds of bamboo. And now we have a great meal. So beautiful. So, now let's take a look at matplotlib. Matplotlib allows you to create beautiful data visualizations with high quality graphs, charts, and figures, and much more. So here you can see some matplotlib graphs that you can create here. Now for your first product, Fashion MNIST. So now you might be a little sad because it's product time. But coding, yes! So let's take a look at that. Okay, so here I'm in the collab here. So today we'll be taking a look at a fashion endless demo where we will build a neural network to classify images of clothing. So here we're gonna import packages and load our data set. So here we're basically import everything and then print out the tensile version. So next, we'll load our data set from the Keras fashion endless here. And here we're actually gonna split it into the training, training set and the testing set. So the training data is what I'm gonna to use to teach my model and the testing set is what I'm going to use to see how well my model has learned the data set. So next, I'm going to explore, let's explore our data set. So we actually have 10 different types of data inside our data. So we have t-shirt, trousers, and all the way to ankle boots here. So in our training set, we have 60,000 images, each 28 by 28 pixels. And our testing images has 10,000 images, each 28 by 28 pixels. So here you can see a sample image and it's an ankle boot. But there's one thing, we need to convert it to grayscale because a machine learning model can't take in a colored image right now. So here in Python, we can actually do it pretty easy. We all we need to do is just divide it by 255 to convert it to grayscale. So here you can see all our images are now grayscale. So now we'll build our model. So here I'll build our model. So here, first of all, in our input layer, we'll convert our data to a one-dimensional array. Then in our hidden layer, we'll have 128 neurons, and we'll be using the ReLU activation function, which will introduce non-linearity to our model. And our output layer has 10 neurons because there's gonna be 10 different types of input that's gonna be fed to our model here. And then we're gonna compile our model using the odd and atom optimizer, which will find the individual learning rates for each parameter. Finally, the sparse category across entropy will measure the dissimilarity between the predicted class probability and observed class label. Here we'll also calculate our metrics, and here we'll be using the accuracy metric. So now let's train our model. We can train our model by passing the X data, which is the images, and also training labels. And here we have we can pass in the number of epochs. We can also pass verbose so we don't see any output, and also callbacks, but here I'm just going to set an epoch number and our data. So now let's test them all and can see we have a 87% testing accuracy. Hmm, I think we overfitted a little bit here because here you can see in our final epoch, we have 98% accuracy on the training data, but here in our testing accuracy, we only have 87% accuracy. So you can see that we have overfitted a little bit. So here's a challenge for you. Try and play around with my model and also 
play around with the number of epochs to see if you can have an accuracy that's greater than 95%. If you need any help, feel free to reach out to me on Discord. Now we'll take a look at our predictions and you can see here our predictions is nine. So remember from our class names array? So the nine is our index inside our array. You can see it's an Urkel boot. So let's take a look at the correct label and it's also nine. So this is a correct prediction. Let's plot out that prediction and can see that we got it correct. So the blue means that we got it correct and the red means we got it wrong. So our model got sandal wrong here. So let's plot every scene. So our model is actually doing pretty good here, all except for the sneaker. So congratulations on solving your first project in machine learning. So now we're at the moon, congratulations. So now for my grand finale, drum roll please. What if, what if what? Where there's no code required to create machine learning models and no machine learning experience required. Drum roll please. Introducing Teachable Machine. Teachable Machine is a web-based tool that allows you to create machine learning models fast, easy, and accessible for everyone. Teachable Machine is great for kids, but more importantly, it's something for everyone. The Teachable Machine currently can handle images, sounds, and body poses. So here's how it works. First step, you need to gather all of your data sets. Then you train your model, and then you can test your model to see how it performs on training and also export it for your own project. So let's take a look at a live demo here. So here I'm gonna create a new image project. So today I'm gonna to let it classify images of me holding three and five. So I'm gonna rename the labels to three and five. So here I'm gonna upload images of me holding um, three. Okay, I have my data, three now five. Okay, now let's train our model. So you can see we have, um, we trained for 50 epochs and for each epoch we'll have 16 batches and the learning will be 0 0.001. Okay, so now that it's trained, you can see I can test my model. So here I can see three and it's pretty good here, how about five? Pretty good. But what I think is great about T12 machine is that once you have this, all you need to do is click export model and can put it onto your website, load it from TensorFlow, and also put it on your own mobile app. So what just happened there? Well, what just happened was transfer learning. Transfer learning allows you to train on an, your own input data and then, tr and then change the input data and retrain again with about the same accuracy. So an example of this is, for example, neural style transfer. Here we have a content image and a style image, and we get a generated image. The generated image will be the style image with the content image on the top. So here you can see the person points along the style of Van Gogh into the final generated image. A more advanced example of this is style GNN, where basically here we're generating faces of fake people based on faces of real people. So congratulations on making it this far. So now for some takeaways of my talk. Machine learning is everywhere, and machine learning is for everyone, which means you, yeah, you sitting in your chair, you can become a machine learning engineer with a little help from Google's TensorFlow. We're back on Earth, you survived, congratulations. Now everyone's mind can listen to this quote from the founder of Coursera and DeepLearning.ai, Andrew and G. AI is akin to building a rocket ship. You need a huge engine and a lot of fuel. The rocket engine is the learning algorithms, but the fuel is the humongous amounts of data that can feed to those algorithms. Andrew and G. So what he's saying is that to build a really good machine learning model, we need a good algorithm and a ton of data. The more data we have, the better. So here are some next steps in your machine learning journey. You can install Tensor from the official Tensor site, and also I highly recommend you check out Google's free machine learning crash course where they cover the most of the machine learning algorithms and also awesome TensorFlow which contains a great resource for learning TensorFlow and also TensorFlow Playground. Yes, TensorFlow Playground. It allows you to build a neural network in your browser and don't forget to check out Machine Learning Zero to Hero on YouTube where it's from my good friend Lawrence Morty on the Google TensorFlow team. Now, Give yourself a round of applause for learning the basics of such a hard concept. 
So thank you for listening. I'm Aaron Ma. Don't forget to check out my top, my website at AaronHMa.com. And also don't forget to send me an email at hi at AaronHMa.com. I'm available for 14 hours, seven days. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at AaronHMa, where I'll be posting out the slide deck, and also the tips and tricks into machine learning. Thank you for listening and have a great day. Goodbye. Hey, that's great. That's a very, very good talk. It's like one of the best talk I've ever seen in EuroPython, to be honest. And uh, actually, there's one question for you. And actually, uh, because your talk is so amazing, all the things that you do is so interesting. So do you find actually the things in school are a bit boring for you? <laughs> uh, I would say it's actually pretty boring, to be honest. It's not that fun because basically follow the basics of Common Core. They don't teach a lot. They basically teach this, like this, you go blah, blah, blah. There's, I don't think, I think school's pretty boring. Yeah, so you want to just stick with machine learning and all this AI mm -hmm. and all this stuff, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. That's you can really feel good. a limited thing with it. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but I think like you can maybe do both because like the school stuff mm -hmm. is, you know, so easy for you, you can do everything mm -hmm, yeah. actually <laughs> yeah that, that's that's great or maybe you can use machine learning to like to finish for mm -hmm. the school work <laughs> yeah yeah okay so um yeah so i think now is almost the time for the closing session so that would happen mm -hmm. in uh brian so thank okay. you so much and we would love to see you again or maybe show something mm -hmm. like uh exciting next mm -hmm. time yeah so mm -hmm. um if you have uh, any more questions, you can maybe uh, continue the chat uh, you know, on Discord server. And mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a dedicated room mm -hmm, yeah. for this talk. So uh, you can mm -hmm. actually continue the discussion there. And so uh, that's it for the Pirates room now. And the closing mm -hmm. session, again, is in the, um, in the Microsoft room. So uh, I'll see you all there. So mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>